all those that are watching by way of streaming and the internet and television. And we know some of you are sitting at home watching, not feeling well. We speak healing on your body. We know some of you might be watching from a hospital room. I believe you're going to get checked out today in Jesus' name. How many believe that? Say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil's messed with you one day too long. Tell somebody, the devil's messed with you one day too long. When you walk out here today, he done messing with you. How many are going to start messing up with the devil? going to mess the devil up. I'm tired of the devil messing me up. There's authority in the believer. Visitors, so glad for you to be here today. We know it's so cold. We apologize. The other half of the church has been without air, uh, heat. And uh, we will be fixed Monday or Tuesday. And so uh, we apologize for that. But the uh, guest room, so we don't freeze you out. We, when you go out, it'll be in the coffee shop today. So somebody will be in the coffee shop to meet you and greet you. And I'll be out there or somebody in the staff and just talk to you. We have gifts for you. And uh, no, one more one more announcement. Um, Wednesday, Tuesday is our well, we're starting corporate prayer. Tuesday night at 7, church is open. We'll be here led by uh, my mother. Uh, we call her Mimi. I call her mom. And uh, wonderful intercessor prays for me. Wednesday, God spoke to me last week, told me to turn Wednesday into a day of fast. We're fasting. We're going to ask you to fast. We're not making you fast. We're going to ask you to fast. Somebody asked, well, what do I fast? Food. Somebody said, I'm going to fast TV. I said, no, watch TV, fast food. And somebody said, well, well, I can't. I said, well, nobody's making you. We're not a Gestapo church, you know. <laughs> but the, some things only shifting by fasting and praying. And, and I believe we're in a paramount moment in a season and a shifting. And hell's coming after. And I'm going to talk to you and teach you a little bit. Uh. But religious uh, attendance is not going to give you power over satanic uh, uh, attack. And uh, if you were here Sunday, I talked about what God spoke to me. And you can write these scriptures down. You should read them. Matthew 24, 11, 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Matthew 24, 11. You can write them down. You should read them. 1 Timothy 4, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 and 4. Make it your Bible study. I preached it last week. Or watch replay. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. The Bible talks about a great falling away. I used to think that was the wicked, people leaving the church, going back into the world. But as God began to speak to me, it, it talks about conscience being seared. Say seared. There's a group of people in the last day where their conscience will be seared. And I thought that was uh, the reprobate, the rebellious, the wicked. And God said, oh, no, 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 no. That's those that have been saved so long that they forgot to stay fresh in my presence. And they become religious and they have know so much about me and they've read so many books about me, they forgot how to walk with me. And nobody can correct them. Nobody can rebuke them. Nobody can train them. They think they're untrainable now. They know everything. And he said, it is very imperative that when you think you know everything, forget everything you've learned and relearn me. Look at somebody and tell them, say, you need to relearn God. You need to relearn God. So he said, be a great falling away. A great up. And, then, and then Paul told, Pete, uh, told Timothy, he said, and this apostasy, this, this, this has to happen for the Antichrist to take position. There has to be a religious shifting. Now, I'm not in the religious faith. I'm in the kingdom faith, okay? So look at somebody and say, I'm in the kingdom of God. I am the church. I don't go to church. Uh, you'll get that in a little bit. I am the church. I don't go to church. The trend says you can't do prayer things like this no more. It takes up too much time. Well, I say the devil is a liar. Satan's coming after your children. He's coming after your marriage. Matter of fact, I want to decree right now, divorce be canceled out in somebody's life in the name of Jesus right now. I want, I want everybody to pray right now that the home is under attack. The marriage is under attack. Why? The marriage is the only thing God created that looks like the church. Father, I rebuke divorce in the Yahshua's name. In the name of Jesus, marriages will not be divided. Robo Yasha Kapobo Shataya. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Turn your Bibles to 
Romans chapter 13, verse 11. I'm going to start there. I'm going to talk to you about the things that God is speaking to me about 2018. So Wednesday will be a day of fasting. Wednesday night we'll do praise and worship and go into prayer. So we're going to be praying Tuesday corporately and Wednesday. The whole church uh, will be praying. Uh, I believe we're going to uh, start appointing some of you to come up and lead us in prayer. Uh, I know uh, Ron and, and Johnny for men, and then we would go get some of the young people. Mark, get some of the young people uh, to do. Uh, yeah, get them. Just start lining them up. Make sure they know how to pray. Don't give me no weak one. Give me a give me a warrior. Give me a warrior. Romans chapter thirteen, verse eleven. If you started in verse 8, it says, oh, no, man, nothing except to love one another. You'd get on down. You should read that and then get into verse 11. So verse 11 is this. And do this knowing the time. Do this knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. I want you to underline that word sleep. Wait. It's time to wake up. For now our salvation is nearer than when, it, than when we first believed. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Something's closer now than when, it, when we started. Look at somebody say, it's, it's about to get better. According to Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, For with joy will you draw from the wells of salvation. Plural. There's not... One salvation, there's plural, there's many wells. Most of the religious uh, mindset is we preach one well of salvation, and that's run to a cross and receive the, man, dying, the dying man on the cross and call him your Lord, which is the first door. But then there's many wells of salvation because that saved your soul. But there's a salvation for your finances. There's a salvation for your health. There's a salvation well for your mind. There's a, there's a well for your deliverance. Uh, I don't want to get stuck at one well. I want to start shopping the plethora of wells God has placed in my life. It says the night is far spent. The day is at hand. This word day, what, what, what Paul's talking about here is there's a spirit of illumination coming. God's about to illuminate some things, and you're going to see some things you didn't know you was there, things that have hidden themselves in your house and in your spirit. And if you're not willing to be uncomfortable for a season, God can't change you to your next season. You have to become comfortable being uncomfortable with God. God never puts something in your life that doesn't stretch your mind and, and your calendar and your time schedule. I've learned this with God. He does not negotiate with other things. You either make him first, he won't be second. He won't be third. Look at somebody and say, God's either first or he's last. Wait a minute, that's a movie. You're the first or you're last. What was that? Ricky Bobby. I don't know how we got that anointing on me right there, but I just figured it out. God will not take second fiddle to anything in our lives. Either he is preeminent or he ain't. He's first, and that's it. He said, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of what? This is talking about illumination. This is talking about illumination. Let us walk circumspectly or properly as in the day, not in rivalry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision, give no place to the flesh to fulfill its addictions. There's a warning here from Paul saying the night has been spent. There's four watches in a night. 
There were three watches on the Jewish calendar, but when the Roman Empire took over, they added four watches. There are four watches. The times of the four watches are 6 to 9 p.m. is first watch. 9 to 12 is second watch. 12 to 3 is third watch. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. is the fourth watch. Now, I'm telling you this because if you understand this, I, I was telling Pastor this yesterday, I, I, my mind is, is stuck on this fourth watch thing, fourth watch. And then I started looking up last night. I went downstairs and was looking things up. And the, the remember the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins? Remember there were ten virgins, five, five wise, five foolish? The wise virgins had enough oil so that on the fourth watch, they didn't miss the bridegroom. The bridegroom came on the fourth watch. He came from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And it, the, the other, the, the five foolish weren't unsaved. That's what you have to get. They weren't unsaved. They weren't uneager. They weren't non-praisers. If you caught the fourth watch and the third watch, if you caught the ten on the first watch, they were praising the same. If you walked in on them on the second watch, the, the ten virgins, they, were, they had the same stuff. They, they, all ten had oil. So they weren't uneager. They weren't unlearned. They were unprepared. I hope you wrote that down because some of you are eager, but you're unprepared. And what was is that what Jesus is trying to say is I'm coming in, a, in an hour where it's easy to be unprepared. And if you'll notice the fourth watch, there was a lot of miracles that took place on the fourth watch. When Paul and Silas were in prison, it was on the third watch Paul started praying. Paul started praying and Silas started praising and praying on the third watch at midnight. But the angel showed up at the fourth watch at three. He kicked the gates open and freed everybody on the hour where most people are unprepared. Now, I don't understand this except that God was trying to tell me that it's not that I have to be up at 3 a.m., but from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It's not that you got to get up and be sitting and looking out your window. What he's talking is metaphorically. That it's so easy to get in a slumber and an and a unpreparedness in your life. That you're so caught up in your life you stop looking for the bridegroom. And we got a generational church gathering that aren't looking for the bridegroom. They're looking for a better band, better singing. They're looking for better lights. They're spending money on better fog machines. And you know what? Listen, fake smoke, where there's fake smoke, there's no fire. Oh, y'all get that in a little bit. And you might smoke up the building with a fog machine, but there ain't no fire in that, that fake smoke. And without the fire of the Holy Spirit... There is going to be no deliverance, no healing. We're not going to turn this thing uh, 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 back, just turn the enemy back away from our house. He's going to start taking our children and our grandchildren because he doesn't play church. Uh, he's play, he doesn't play. He is in warfare for our very lives. But I decree and declare that every plot, every scheme, every strategy, every plan of hell that's come against your generation, your children, your children's children, your home, your marriage, your mind, your health. I hope you're watching, Robert. I abort it in the name of Yahshua. Do I want to know, is there any kingdom warriors here ready to dispatch some warfare angels? If you are, give me a shout all over the house. Give me a Judah shout. Tell the enemy you can't have my children. Tell them right now, you can't have my marriage. I don't care how many demons you sent to my house. You got to send a lot of devils. I only got to speak one name. You can get the host of hell to show up at my house, but one name will drive every host 
out of your house. And that name is Jesus. There's a shift coming. And you're either going to get in it or God's going to knock you out the way of it. This great falling away scares me because it's not the wicked, it's the righteous who think they're okay. I, my prayer, since I've been studying this, my prayer is, oh God, do I please you? Is my decisions good with you? Am I putting something before you? Please tell me. I want to be prepared for the fourth watch. The Bible said the, Paul, the disciples were sleeping in, were in the boat and the storm come. But notice Jesus was walking on the water on the fourth watch. And when I, I was, so God was just telling me last night, he said, if they would have been asleep, they would have drowned in the lake. He said, but because one of them was watching on the fourth watch, they saw me coming by. And then God said, do you know how many times you've missed me in your storm because you weren't prepared to look for me? Do you know how many times things have sunk in your life, but I was walking on top of the water, but you were so focused on, on what you needed for you, you weren't prepared to see who I was in the storm? Do you know how many times I've entered your bedroom to wake you, but you wouldn't get up? According to Job 33, if you went to Job 33... What verse, Job 33, 8 maybe, 11, let me look. That, I live on this verse right here for my children. I live on this verse for anybody. I'm, I don't have to go screaming the gospel. I just won't call Job 33. Let me see if I can find it. I won't, to, I won't give it to you. Well, Bishop, is it in your notes? No, it ain't in my notes. That's why I'm looking for it. No, I'm preaching out of the, out of the oils of heaven, not just from a notepad. If you want a sermon, go to somebody else's church. You want to hear what God's got on the press, come to this one. Job 33, 13, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of any of his words. God don't have to tell you why he called you or why he told you to give something up. He ain't got to explain it to you. To be like, well, God, you just tell me why you want me. I ain't got to tell you why. If I tell you to get up, there's a purpose in it. For God may speak to one way or, to, or in another, yet man does not perceive it in a dream, in a vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds. Oh, hallelujah. In, listen, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions. Look at verse 17. In order to turn, in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. While you're sleeping, God's entered your bedroom to download divine intelligence. Oh, hallelujah. How many want some divine intelligence up in this house? Tell four or five people, say, your ignorance has been concerning us lately. Your spiritual ignorance is concerning me. Go ahead, wives. Look at your husband. Go ahead. You know you've been wanting to say it, but put spiritual in there so he don't get mad at you. Your spiritual ignorance. But then look back at her and say, well, don't down me too, don't down me too much. You, you said yes to this ignorant. <laughs> God spoke to me some things. I want you to write them down. 2018 It's going to be the year of something new. It's going to be the year of something new. Say something new. Now look up here for a moment because I want to make you very unhappy for a second. When God is going to bring something new, he's going to have to kill something that was. Now, you have to know the order of God. And the, and my, and the biggest travesty in church is few people know the true nature of God. They know a church nature, not a Bible nature. 
God said he's going to do something new in 2018, and that means that something that was has got to leave for something that is to show up. And when you are embracing for something new, the old's got to die. Now, I got a decree right now. The old you is going to die. The old things in your marriage are going to die. The old ways of your perception, they got to die. Why? Because God's going to give you some new things in your marriage and some new things in your mind and some new things in your life. But you got to be willing to let things die for something to live. God told me he's going to do some new things in 2018. 18, 1 and 8. 18, say 18. It is the Hebrew number of life in abundance. 18 is the Hebrew number of life in abundance. The Hebrew children, the Jews, when they give in offerings uh, uh, at newborn babies or, or, or blessing somebody, they do their giving in increments of 18, 18, 36. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? If you just kept putting 18, in t- five times 18 is 90. I'm telling everybody on partner on Monday Morning Motivation to sow a, a $90 seed. Call it your life in abundance seed above your partnership seed. 18 times 5. New thing. A new thing. When God shows up with new, it's going to stretch your flesh because your flesh is comfortable in what was. That's why dieting's hard. Somebody told me going to Daniel fast. I said, it's not really a fast, it's a diet. I mean, technically it was a diet. God didn't tell Daniel to fast. He was picking a different diet. I like Dominic Alote said, people come and say, I'm fasting TV. He said, that ain't no fast. Please. God told me, number two, we're going to move. This is really going to make us uncomfortable, this next one, but I love it. Number one, new things. I want to say this. If you're in a dark moment, it's because a new thing's on the way. Oh, I want to say that again. Somebody needs, I'm going to prophesy this right now. If you're in a dark nightmare, get ready. God's about to turn your nightmare into divine strategy. Oh, holla. Who am I prophesying to right now? Whatever you're, if you feel broken and in dark places, there's about to be divine download of divine intelligence in your house right now. And God said, what looks like it's going to break you is going to bend you into a new you. And what hell meant to beat you down, God's going to use as the nail to build up a new house in your life. How many of you felt like quitting, crying, and sick, and hurt at the end of 2018? Guess what? God said, get ready. I'm about to wipe that out. And I'm about to do a new thing. Number two, I'm about to move in the supernatural. That's what God told me. 2018 is about to move in some supernatural ways. There's about to see, we're about to, we're about to have some supernatural praise. We're about to have some supernatural singing. And I'll tell you something, I'd rather have a supernatural visitation of God than three hours of good singing. Now, you need to look at somebody and say, now look, it might make you uncomfortable when God starts casting demons out. But where the devil's got to go. Number three, God spoke to me and he said, there will be opposition. There's going to be opposition. Hell is not going to let you go. Hell's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you experience the supernatural. He's not going to want you to turn your priorities back to the kingdom because he knows that if you seek first the kingdom, that God's going to give you what the Gentiles seek. There's going to be a surge of prosperity, so it's not going to come without opposition. You're going to have to overcome tiredness. You're going to have to overcome. You Listen to me. You're going to have to become spiritually intuitive. And you're going to have to discern who hell is using to keep you anchored in your now. Let me, can, can I talk for a little bit? Hell's not just going to show up with horns and a fork and knock on your door, Heather and Jason, and say, Hi, I'm Lucifer, and I'm coming in here to take your house because he knows you ain't that dumb. 
No, he's going to use things that are connected to you. And you've got to have discernment to know who hell is using to distract you from divine purpose. That'll be the opposition. If you was in Matthew 16, I believe it's Matthew 16. You ever heard the story in Matthew 16? Jamel, you heard this story. Jesus is talking to Peter and he's telling him his plans. You remember that in Matthew 16? What is it, 1633? Is it Matthew 1633? Look it up for me, somebody. Matthew, is there not a Matthew 16? Well, let me look. Hang on. Hang on. It's Matthew something. Matthew 16 what? 13, what's it say? Is, is Jesus talking to Peter? Matthew 23. When Jesus came into the region, Matthew 23. But he turned and he said to Peter, remember this? Go to verse 22. Look at verse 22. He's telling them his plans. He said, and, and go to the next verse, verse 21 then. He, watch. Jesus says, and for that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from, uh, uh, from the elders and the chief priests. Peter, is, and their disciples are walking with Jesus. He's telling them his assignment. Okay? Now notice when he starts telling them what they don't want to perceive. He's telling them what his plans are. Peter, in the next verse, who's got the ear of Jesus, says, next verse, and then Peter took him aside and began to re rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not, Did he just rebuke the man of God? Are you crazy? Now, how many people have Peter raised from the dead? None. How many people, blind eyes, did Peter heal? None. This is dangerous. People who get too close to the pulpit start thinking they can control it. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Come, come, come up here, Richie. Come up here, Richie. Come up here. You're Peter. I'm sorry. It's okay. Ron, come up here behind him. You're Satan. <laughs> so you was mad being Peter? He's Satan. <laughs> well, you wore all black, so I figured you're going to come in here looking like Johnny Cash. The ring of fire. <laughs> Look like Johnny Cash today. He walked in the office. I said, You going to a funeral? He said, Maybe I am. <laughs> I'm going to show you something that's going to give you a clue on how Satan works. I'm going to show you something. Peter is who I chose. And I'm telling Peter God's plans for where we're going. Satan doesn't come to me. Satan finds who's got my ear. Because if Satan would have came to Jesus, Jesus would have knew who it was. So Satan knows how to use what's close to you to distract you. And so he's whispering to him. So you whisper to him quietly. He's whispering to him. I'm telling him he starts whispering to me. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to go. I've got to die. The elders are going to crucify me. He starts telling him to tell him. And Jesus pauses. Next verse. He doesn't you turn to Peter. He doesn't say, Peter, you're out of order. Look what he says. He turned to Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You know what Jesus just did? He just had divine intelligence. He just had divine illumination. He just learned a source that's attacking him, and it wasn't Peter. He said, I ain't got time to talk to Peter because Peter ain't the voice that's trying to turn me. It's the voice of the enemy who's trying to find what's close to me to turn my divine purpose. So he said, I'm not going to take offense to Peter. I'm not going to fuss at Peter. I'm not going to get at war with Peter. I'm going to tell the devil, leave Peter alone. You got something to say? You come say it to my face. You mad enough to talk to Peter? You ought to be mad enough to talk to me. 
Oh, you don't want to mess with me because you know that as soon as you open your mouth, I would have shut you up. But I got to discern who hell's using to become a distraction to divine purpose. Oh. And see, and if we're not careful, we'll pick an offense up with each other. And we'll get mad at each other. And we'll assume it's the, it'll be a husband and wife and you'll blame the spouse for what you're going through. And you'll, I don't need you in my life. You got to get, Peter, get out of my life. You're always, no, no, no. It wasn't Peter. It was the enemy. And, and I ain't got time to fight Peter. Because Peter ain't my enemy. Peter loves me. He, re, he loves me. He's, but he's hurting because he's afraid of my assignment. But hell sees the connection. And you got to watch who you share your purpose with because you be trusting someone who's trusting someone's voice you wouldn't trust. If you don't get spiritually woke up, you're going to be on the third watch and run out of oil. Because you're going to be unprepared when he comes whispering. See, because Peter and I got to stay together. I'm going to need Peter. See, let me tell you something. Peter's making mistakes, but here's Jesus. I'm going to need Peter. I don't need him. He's our enemy. I don't have to discern he's my enemy. I have to discern whose voice has Peter now listened to. Peter quit listening to my voice. He started listening to some, the same way. Doesn't it interesting, interesting that Satan doesn't come to Adam? He comes to Eve. He found out who had Adam's ear. Someone's connected to you. Hell's using to distract you. Someone's going to call you today that ain't sent by God, but has been sent by Lucifer. And the person calling you is not the devil. They're being led by him. So you need to get a divine intelligence and look past the voice talking to you and start talking to the voice that's talking behind them. I serve jurisdiction over that voice. See, see, listen, 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 Lucifer. He knows he has no jurisdiction on the earth, but he does. He knows he can't just show up and dictate things because the earth is not his realm. It's man's realm. Go to Psalm 15, verse 16. Read it. Psalm 15, 115. Psalms 115, verse 16. Look, Watch, Lucifer. Read this right here. Not that, man. Psalms 115, verse 16, I believe it is. Okay, what's that say, Lucifer? The heaven, even the earth, the uh, heavens, even, and even the heavens are the, are the Lord. But, but the earth he has given to the children of men. I can't have it. You can't have it. <laughs> you say, I can't have it. Listen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I might call you back up, though. Now, you know that's not really Lucifer. That's my best friend, Ron. Don't ask Terry. She might say, no, he ain't Ron. He's Lucifer. <laughs> No, she wouldn't say that. They've been married too long. He's he's been house trained. I'm not some. Somebody said to me, they said, "Aren't you the head of your house?" I said, "I'm house broken." The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth belongs to to us. Hell knows he cannot just show up. He has no power in your realm unless you give it to him. Okay, for instance, is this all right? Because I'm talking about number three, opposition. There's going to be opposition. Hell's not coming after you. He's got to find something that's got your attention because then if that person talks to you, they have jurisdiction on the earth. He doesn't. 
This is why when in, in the book of Genesis, uh, the Bible said that, that uh, um, Jacob wrestled with God. You ever read that? It's really an angel. You know one God, right? Okay. Some, in some translations, he was wrestling with himself because your future is not dictated by anything but how you see yourself. And until Jacob sees Israel, the nation couldn't be born. But the Bible said it was at the fourth watch. Watch. At midnight, the angel shows up. Jacob gets a hold of them. They wrestle for two watches and come into the end of the fourth watch at 6 a.m. Daylight. The angel said, let me go. Let me go. Daylight's coming. And Jacob said, not till you bless me. So you got to learn to put a command on the blessing. You got to stop begging for things and start commanding some stuff up in your house. If you don't like where you are, start commanding some things. You don't like your weight, get in the mirror and command some thinness on you. Get some boldness about you. Now I like me, any size. I'm supersized. This is an angel who's celestial in power but cannot break the grips of man yet can command demons to flee and they flee. But when he got into the realm of the earth, Jacob had more power than the angel. Why? Because the angel was not in his jurisdiction. He was in man's jurisdiction. And in man's jurisdiction, even the celestial has to be ruled by man. So finally he said, let me go. The Bible said he hit him in the hip, dislocated his hip. The Bible said that while they were wrestling, the angel hit him in the hip to dislocate, and he still wouldn't let him go. So he had to ask him, you got to let me go, bro. And so Jacob let him go. He said, but I'm not, okay, don't leave until you bless me. What was Jacob telling him? I ain't sitting here wrestling through eight-hour watch here for you to knock my hip out of socket. And that's all I get out this fighting. Because I'm not going to fight unless there's reward. You don't go to battle unless there's a reward. And he said, what's your name? He said, Jacob. Now, interesting, he tells him his name, Jacob, but the angel don't know him. The angel went into the download of heaven and said, well, your name ain't on the list. Because that wasn't the name that God called him. He said, but your name, I did see your name, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an astral around it. What does it say? Your name's really Israel. And at that moment, a nation was born by an identity shift in one man. The nation of Israel. Because an identity got discovered but the angel couldn't leave, and Jacob wouldn't have changed had he not wrestled on the fourth watch. The Bible said in Jude, the angel come down, Michael. Michael comes down, and the Bible said, God said, Michael, go down there and get the bones of Moses. The Bible said that Michael was going down to get the bones of Moses, but Satan, Lucifer, had already got there. So he, they're on the earth. And Lucifer, can I borrow your cup? He takes the bone of Moses. He got the bone of Moses. I'm going to... So you don't, I don't get no, no on me. Okay, he gets the bone of Moses, right? He's already got him on the earth. Where is he at? Where's this taking place? On the earth. God says, Michael, go down there, find your bo Moses' bones and bring them here so they, make a, they don't make a shrine and start worshiping. He gets down there and Satan says, <laughs> I got here first. I knew the plan of God for you did. And now watch Michael. He says, Satan, I take no reproach against you. Now, this is Michael who threw him out of heaven. He threw Satan out of heaven and all a third of his angels. It was his army that beat the devil and said, get out. But now he's telling him, I take no reproach against you. The Lord rebukes you because the Lord sent me for the, these bones here. And what, what, why, why did he do that? Because he knew he was not in his jurisdiction. 
he was in the earth jurisdiction. He didn't have the same power on earth that he had in, the, in heaven because heavens were for the Lord, but the earth was for men. And he said, Satan, you know down here we're out of jurisdiction, so I'm not going to bring a reproach against you because my, 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 I don't have legal right here. He said, but I'm going to subpoena you to the courtroom of heaven because God sent me here for these bones. So here's your option. Give me the bones now or you're going to have to meet me in the courtroom with God. I'm about to serve you a subpoena. And if I subpoena you, you got to, you got to come because if you subpoena, you don't, first of all, you don't want to be in contempt of God's court. So you, you want to be subpoenaed or give me the bones? And you know what the Bible said? Without hesitation, Satan said here. Why? Because I know we may not have jurisdiction here, but I know who created it. God. And what you're trying to learn is there's going to be opposition. But if hell shows up at your house, he showed up because somebody who had jurisdiction invited him there. Oh, y'all didn't want to hear that, I know. No, we need to go home. It's already went too far. God and Lucifer are rallying for man. Because for God to work on the earth, he needs a man to release it. If hell's going to do anything on the earth, he needs a man to release it. And whichever one you make covenant to, that's the one that's going to rule your house. Now, I'm going to tell you all right now, I'm about to serve an eviction notice to every demon I've given a permission to. How many want to serve some eviction notice to every devil you give permission to in your life? Or your, grand, or your grandparents or your generational curses or, or your bloodline or your father's father. I ain't picking up any of it. Why? Because by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, I am set free from the law of sin and death. Uh, and I'm going to tell the enemy right now by the blood and by the power and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I give God supreme rule over my home my house my atmosphere my property I give to my king and I give him divine jurisdiction over my grandbabies and babies over my wife over my children over my mind over my money who gonna get up in agreement with me and tell the devil to get the hell up out the house somebody say devil get the hell out of here I dare you to say Satan get the hell off my wife Satan get the hell out of my house you get back to hell where you belong. You ain't got no jurisdiction here. You out of line. You out of order. You out of place. You are deceptor. I got divine power and I got authority. And the earth belongs to me, not you. And God belongs in the heavens. And I'm going to reach way up high and grab the high place of the heavens. And I'm going to bring them way down low into the earth. Why Jesus said, pray this prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What Jesus was saying to you, y'all need to circumvent that atmosphere and tell the prince of the powers of the air, you might live in the atmosphere, but I'm pulling the kingdom of God through it. That's why prayer is very important. That's why intercessory prayer is very powerful because when your intercessors are praying, they're giving legal right to move in jurisdiction. That's why you want to know who's praying for you. You don't want no Jezebel praying for you. Whoa. Giving the wrong spirits jurisdiction. The word jurisdiction means legal right. You can be a city police officer, and you're a police officer, but you can't go to Charlotte and arrest somebody. That doesn't change that you're not that you're still an officer of the law. But the problem is, is you just stepped out of your jurisdiction, and just because you maintain your identity doesn't mean you've maintained your authority. Just because you know how to use it don't mean you got right to wield the badge. Because the seven sons of Sceva learned how to pull out the badge. And they said, 
in the name of Jesus, Satan, come out of him. And the devil recognized the authority of the name and the, and the demon jumped up. And then he looked at the guy. Was you the one just said in the name of Jesus? Well, Jesus, I know. I know Paul. Who are you? You a cocky little sucker. That's what you are. Oh, you done learned a little bit. Of, you went to Sunday school today, huh? You learned a little seven keys to kick in my butt. But you haven't been authorized yet. So you might be a believer, but you are illegal. You are out of jurisdiction here. Because the formula is not the covering. You might got a formula, you be talking like you got it all going on, but the walk got to match the talk. And somebody taught you how to talk. But I ain't seen you walk yet. And the Bible said, now look, the devil had obeyed the rule. The law was by the name. There is no other name given. So the devil left the guy. I believe you going to wish you'd had a covering. Why? Because I'm leaving him. You should have left me right there, buddy. Because I'm about to beat you naked. The Bible said that devil come out and strip his clothes off of him. Beat him butt naked. They wrote the song, He Just a Streak. It was, <laughs> that dude went to streaking through Jerusalem. A naked man run down the street going, I cast the devil out and he took my clothes. The guy got up, he's all delivered. He gets home, tells his wife, naked man set me free. I don't know who he was, but... Demons on me jumped on him, beat his clothes off him. They, he must not. I'll tell you what. Whatever he's wearing, we're not buying. I think. I think Satan don't like Ralph Lauren. <laughs> Buy my shirt at Walmart. Now, what you don't understand is, watch, 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 watch. What you don't understand is, is if you're not covered, you'll use the badge without proper jurisdiction. What you cast off of someone now comes and haunts you. We was casting a spirit last Sunday off of somebody, weren't we? Right in the back there. Some African demon come up out of that man. Did it not? I never spoke a tongue like that in my life. I speak in a tongue. I started speaking a tongue and it sounded African. Did it not sound African? Was you, you was there with me, wasn't you? Did it sound African to you? I never spoke that tongue before. Y'all keep that. I mean, I mean, I was speaking tough. And that demon starts screaming at us. You know nothing about Africa. I don't got to know nothing about Africa. I know Yahshua. Say you're out of jurisdiction here, bud. We in the kingdom of God. And guess what? We're going to cast out devils. God said there's going to be opposition. He did what he said. Let me tell you what he said. There's going to be opposition. But look what he said to me. But I'm going to download at that moment divine intelligence. Whew. I'm going to close there come back and preach on it later. I'm going to download in your opposition something your flesh couldn't tell you. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm running Josh out of here. I'm so done. You're supposed to come this way, not that way. The altar's this way, bro. <laughs> Go Tigers. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I love Josh. I was talking about Clemson. Listen to me. I'm closing. I'm done. Life doesn't come without battles. Look, look. Let me close. Let me tell you. Change doesn't come without making hard decisions. Sometimes to make a God decision, you got to leave people that you really do love. But you got to trust God here. That until I fix me, I couldn't fix them anyways. 
people. Sometimes I've got to move away from people and get healed of myself so that when I come back into their atmosphere, I can help them. If you really love them, you'd fix you. It hurts to let things go. It hurts when blessing gets delayed and you're still faithful. It, it, it plays with your head. It hurts when you keep trying to love something that won't love you back. It hurts. It's, it's a wound. It's deep. It's crushing to see someone you love be blinded and just scratch your head and go, God, I pray, I intercede, I ask, I talk, and they're still blinded. That's where you now got to say, but I trust you. David said, he is your strong tower. But that's not good if you don't know how to run into him. So David said, I run into him and I am safe. I didn't understand that. What he means is, you know how you hurting out here? Come in here. You're going to hurt, but you, at least you're safe hurting. Ain't nobody going to take advantage of your pain in my presence. But we don't teach this kind of gospel. Opposition hurts, but in it is where you learn divine intelligence. Because if you have a wound, you're going to keep, listen to me, girls, you're going to keep dating the wrong guys. You ain't never going to find your Adam until you find your Eve. Until you find you, you'll always date wrong you'll always make wrong friends mister listen to me until God got Adam where he needed him then after God did all these things to Adam taught him who he was showed him how to talk to God taught him how to walk with God then he said now it's not good for this man to be alone why because I made him perfect to be a husband then he gives him Eve God wouldn't give you a man he ain't first cleaned up himself. God, girls, listen to me. If God ain't cleaned up the man you're dating, kick him to the curb. Let God have him. If, if that man won't go follow God and let God clean him up, you are free to keep walking. Because if God's involved in it, he'll make the Adam that covers the Eve. Marriage is the greatest thing when it's that. It ain't when it ain't. Man covers Eve. Eve covers the children. And God covers man. I was praying one day for some marriages, and God said, no, 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 no. And I was asking God. He said, ah. And I said, well, I need you to touch that. You know, this guy's hurting. I want his wife to love. He said, ah, ah. ain't going to happen. I said, why? He said, no, no, no. I made man for me. I made woman for man. I made the kids for legacy. He said, if the man ain't giving me what I want, I ain't giving the man what he wants. He said, the man ain't pleasing me. His wife ain't pleasing him. He can pray all he wants, but until he puts me first, why would I let her put him first? But he said, but let him line up to me. Let him cry in my presence. Let him get up and say, let's go. We go into church. He said, and watch that woman within months line up and change and be under him. Why? Because I'll send angels to that house. I'll start working on her behalf. I'll start bringing his house. If, you, if that man don't put my house first, why should I put his house second? So we don't teach that. Men lead women. Women shouldn't be leading men. In the spiritual order, I'm not talking about equality and at jobs and paychecks. I'm talking about in covering. The man was to find God and bring the house of God under God's covering. And what I want is a revival of men to turn their hearts back to God for the fathers to call themselves sons again and say, God is my father and my wife is my strong power and I run into her because I've run into him. 
High five somebody said, that's some just darn good preaching right there. That's all I can say. That's what we're praying for. God to fix our homes. Do you know why our children, you know why our millennial children, did you know that 78% of the millennials say churches are necessary? You know why? Because you baby boomers died in the church. And you became religious. And you didn't, we didn't show the millennials that there's more than just sitting in a pew. There is a power that's greater than the pew. And his name is Yahshua. We didn't go home and cast devils out. And we didn't have moves of God like we should have. We brought them to dead church for years. Uh, and then they said, there ain't no need for God. He's no different than he is in corporate America. The devil is a liar. We're about to have a supernatural move of God. Because you want to win a world? Let God show up. You want to win a generation? Let the blind see again. Let the deaf hear again. Let the lame get up out of chairs again. Cast out some demons. I always say cast out one devil, three people get saved. If you believe that, high five somebody right now. Say, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. How many are, how many are ready? We got to go grab somebody's hand. How many are ready for God to show up in supernatural proportion? How many want God to show up in your house in supernatural proportion? Father, in the name of Jesus, grab somebody's hand. We got to go. Grab somebody's hand. Father, we bind together right now whatever enemy is attacking this hand that I'm holding. Maybe you're holding a woman that's going through pain right now. Maybe you're holding a hand of someone that's going through a marital warfare. Maybe you're holding a hand of someone that just got diagnosed with cancer. You don't know. Maybe they were con contemplating suicide all night. And you grab their hand and have the power to run out something. Father, in the name of Yahshua, I decree victory over opposition in Jesus' name. Victory over opposition in Jesus' name. Somebody say, I got the victory. Now, whose hand you're holding, look at him and say, you got the victory. You got the victory. Stand to your feet. Tell 10 people, you got the victory. 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 This thing's going to end in your victory. Ron, you got the victory. Terry, you got the victory. Marianne, you got the victory, baby. Bobby, you got the victory. Tell 10 people, you got the victory. Now, if you're sowing your $90 seed, if you're sowing your $90 seed, lay it up here on this pulpit. You're 18 times 5. I want to pray over it. Make sure you bring some oil home. We got to make sure we have more oil up here, about 10 bottles. Let's make sure new people bring them home. If you're a guest or visitor, we'll meet you in the coffee shop today because the heats are broke on that side of the church, but they shall be fixed. We got the fire of God over there in Jesus' name. Love you. If you're watching by way of the Internet, you might be watching replay. It's the same anointing. It's the same power. You might be watching Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday. You can use the button on the screen or go to our website and you can sow your seed. I believe there's a power right now in 18 times 5 being first fruit givings, $90. Sow it. Believe God for life and abundance on it in Jesus' name. If you're becoming a monthly partner, then you'll sow a Psalm 65. we got a monthly book we're sending to you this month. It's Daddy God. You'll get a book from me. We'll sow it to you for sowing into us. We love you. We're so glad you're a part of us. Remember, Wednesday night is our prayer. Tuesday night's corporate prayer. Wednesday night is the whole church prayer again. We're turning this month into seeking and interceding into the ear of God for the, for the fourth hour, for the fourth watch. In Jesus' name. Take us away, guys. <laughs>